Welcome to Russian History Retold, Episode 139, The Crimean War, Part 1, A Short History of Crimea. Now, first off, I'd like to apologize to those of you who, you know, are current with the uh, podcast and have missed it for the past few weeks. I had the script written uh, about a week ago, edited, ready to go, and then I came down with a small little lung infection, which also affected my voice. So I decided that instead of sounding like Louis Armstrong, I was going to hold off for a week and let my voice recover, and it's pretty good right now. And on top of it, my wife had hip replacement surgery at the young age of 47, and that kind of made things go a little crazy here in the Schaus household. So I apologize again, and I'm ready to get going on this podcast. Last time, we covered the ensurfment of the Russian peasant, one of, if not the, saddest segment of Russian history. Today, I want to begin to discuss the Crimean War of the 19th century, but within a context that can help shed light on current events between Russia and Ukraine. Now, we can't discuss the war without giving you a thorough review of the history of the Crimean Peninsula. First, let's talk about where the Crimea is located. It's on the northern coast of the Black Sea and on the western coast of the Sea of Azov, bordering the Kherson Oblast from the north. It is in the southern part of Ukraine, opposite from Turkey, and its eastern tip kind of borders Russia. Crimea was known to the ancient world as Taurus and later Taurica by the ancient Greeks. Herodotus claimed that the land was plowed by a huge ox known as the Taurus. The area was also known as the Krimini, or Cliffs. The Greeks were the first of the foreigners to settle in the coastal area of Taurica, with Scythians further inland. They became a part of the Roman Empire from around 100 BCE through the 3rd century AD. Now, after the Romans left, it looked like Crimea became a crossroad for a lot of different invading peoples starting with the Goths in 250, the Huns in 376, the Bulgars, the Hazars, Kievan Rus, the Byzantine Empire, Kipchaks, and finally the Mongols. In the 1200s, though, the Republic of Genoa controlled the coastline of Crimea, including the port city of Sevastopol, seizing it from their rivals, the Venetians. They continued to control the region for about the next 200 years. After Tamerlane crushed the armies of the Golden Horde in 1395 at the Battle of the Terek River, the Crimean Tatars began to take control of the interior lands, beginning in around 1441 under Hasi Giray, a descendant of Genghis Khan. They were initially unsuccessful in taking the port cities from the Genoese. But in 1478, the Crimean Khanate became a tributary to the Ottoman Empire, due partly to the Sultan holding the Crimean leader Menli Gurey captive. But they did really want to become part of the Ottoman Empire because they were Muslims and they wanted to join with their Muslim brethren as an opposition to uh, Orthodox Russia. This led to the eventual removal of the Genoan hegemony over the coastline, bringing it into Crimean Tatar hands under the auspices of the Ottoman Empire. For the next few hundred years, the Crimean Khanate remained semi-autonomous for the most part. The Russians, they just viewed the people with fear and actual deep hatred, and for the most part, this was due to the raids into the territory of Muscovy. The raids were predominantly done to capture slaves to be sold at the Crimean ports. Between 1500 and 1700, over 2 million Russians and Ukrainians were estimated to have been sold. The raids were a major thorn in the side of many a Tsar, with Peter the Great being the first to really stem the tide, although raids continued until 1769. Now, I want to have a correction. I heard on Fox News that one of the commentators there said that Peter the Great was the first one to conquer the Crimean Peninsula. Well, in one statement, it's partially true, but not really entirely. Peter the Great did go in and capture it, but remember, he lost it all. 
and he was almost his whole army, including himself, were almost destroyed by the Turks. So basically, he came in and he got out. He did not have real control over the Crimea at all. The last incursion, actually, during one of the numerous Russo-Turkish wars in 1769, abouts. They had gotten over 20,000 slaves from Russia. So really, Peter didn't have very much control at that time, and neither did Elizabeth or any of the successors. But it was finally in 1774, during the reign of Catherine the Great, the Crimeans actually fell under Russian influence due to the Treaty of Kukuk Kanyarka. In 1783, they were now officially annexed by the Russian Empire, and they were known as the Tarita Governate. So in actuality, it was Catherine who actually, and her army, and Potemkin in particular, was very deeply involved in this, were able to conquer Crimea. Now I'm going to bypass the Crimean War itself for the moment to move forward towards the 20th century. Now, Crimea lost its ports, and Russia lost its ports, basically, due to the war. And what really happened in the Crimean War, it really devastated the land, with most of the destruction focused on economic and social structures. The people, the Crimean Tatars in particular, had everything taken away from them, basically. They had all these armies fighting on their land, and very little is what they received from it. Now, we go into you know the fall of the Romanovs, and we have the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk in 1918 between Germany and the Soviet Union. And that ended Russian involvement in World War I, but they turned Crimea into a German protectorate. Of course, this didn't last very long, as Germany was to lose the war shortly thereafter. The Soviets reoccupied the area in April of 1919. And then we see the civil war reaching its heights. Now, during the Russian Civil War, Crimea was a stronghold of the white forces under General Wrangel, until his army was destroyed by anarchist Nestor Makhno's forces. Over 50,000 people were executed by the Bolsheviks who came in. Both prisoners of war and civilians were shot or hung in one of the largest massacres of the Civil War. October 18, 1921 marked the creation of the Crimean Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic as part of the Russian SFSR. They were to suffer two massive famines, the 1921-22 one and the Holodomor of 1932-33. During World War II, or known to the Russians as the Great Patriotic War, Crimea would be a center of a number of terrible battles. The Nazis controlled most of Crimea from 1941 to 43, as the Reichs Commissariat Ukraine except the mountainous region in which the native people heavily resisted their occupiers. Stalin, though, believed that the Crimean Tatars collaborated with his enemies, and because of this perception and other nefarious reasons, he ordered the entire population of the Tatars be exiled to Central Asia on May 18, 1944, after ousting the Germans. Along with the Tatars, Armenians, Bulgarians, and Greek peoples in the Crimea were also deported. During their trek, an estimated 46% of all Tatars died, mostly due to starvation and disease. The Crimean ASSR was abolished in 1945 and made an oblast within the Russian SFSR. On February 19, 1954, Nikita Khrushchev ordered that the Crimean Oblast be transferred into the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic as a way to mark the 300th anniversary of Ukraine becoming part of the Russian Empire. Of course, the General Secretary Khrushchev was himself a native of Ukraine. We see for the first time that Crimea becomes part of Ukraine is in 1954. In January of 1991, the Crimean Oblast was made an autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic by the Ukrainian Soviet. That didn't last very long, of course, as later that year the Soviet Union collapsed. This led to a very tense situation because of the Soviet Black Sea Fleet, 
was a bone of contention between Ukraine and Russia. Simultaneously, Crimean Tatars began returning to the region, which increased tensions. In February of 1992, the area was renamed the Republic of Crimea. By May of the same year, the parliament declared that they were now officially part of Ukraine. But this was not universally agreed upon, so the Ukrainian government was forced to recognize Crimea as semi-autonomous. Russia and Ukraine, led by the respective presidents Yeltsin and Kravchuk, agreed to divide the old Soviet Navy between the two countries, allowing Russia to have military bases in Crimea. So, despite what some people may have thought, the Russians invaded, they were already there. They had a lot of military bases and a lot of men already in Crimea. Now, the tensions continued with another crisis arising in March of 1995, when the Parliament of Ukraine removed Crimean President Yuri Meshkov for trying to integrate his land with Russia. So as you can see, this is not just a current event here. This has been going on, this crisis. It's been brewing. It's been happening, so there's been a lot of talk that this is something new. I know the American media loves to uh, you know, sensationalize things and, and make believe that this is just something really new and exciting that's going on. But actually, this has been around for a while, especially this integration of Crimea with Russia. Now, over the ensuing years, tensions between Ukrainian, Russian, and Tatar peoples escalated. At present, here's what the demographics look like. It's been estimated that almost 60% of the people who live in Crimea consider themselves Russian, with about 24 Ukrainian and 12% Crimean Tatars. So this kind of shows that there's a bit of a problem with this election that just went on in Crimea, where they say 95.4, I believe is the number, percent of the population wanted to join Russia. When you have 24% of them being Ukrainian, and very obviously, they wouldn't want to do that. Uh, there are some issues going on here. Uh, they do see you know, how bad the economy is in Ukraine as opposed to Russia. Uh, Russia does have the resources. They also have a better infrastructure, it seems. So they're kind of you know, showing the people, hey, you join us, you have a better life. You'll get more social services. And there's also one other issue I wanted to bring up here. One thing that really fundamentally helps the current Russian economy move forward is oil. The economy is slowing down there. They need more capital. They need more cash. They just spent an estimated $50 billion on the Sochi Olympics. And what would help to pay off all that expense but a rise in the price of oil? Now, how do you get the price of oil to go up? Now, understand I have a doctorate in business, uh, I have you know degrees in economics and history, of course. So I looked at this, and basically what they needed was about a 10% increase in oil. And the one way you do it is you increase tensions around the world. And I, I really have a feeling, and this is my opinion only, but I've seen some pretty good evidence for it and what's going on. That the real play here for Putin was he wanted to raise the price of oil. And the best way to do it was to annex Crimea, create a situation in Ukraine, raise tensions around the world. Uh, he has to be very careful here because his economy could tank if enough sanctions are put on by the rest of the world. And let me be honest with you, Putin's there because he's kept the economy up. His popularity is at 72% from the latest poll in Russia. He really doesn't care what we think about him. He cares what his people do. And if the economy were to tank, his numbers would go down, and I would say would have a very tenuous hold on his presidency and his control of the country. So that's my little opinion about why we have a Crimean crisis. Uh, he's pushing buttons here. Uh, he also wants to have the Russian uh, peoples to feel proud of an empire again. Uh, you know, Obama did call him, uh, you know, kind of a regional power, and I think that was a mistake to to make that claim. Uh, I know I'm going a little off here, but I think it's an important issue that we talk about. You know, Russian history, we're looking at current events. We have to look at what the past tells us about what's happening in the current situation. And I really do think that this is an economic uh, play 
and not just a land grab, although it is a land grab. You know, I'm not going to make any uh, judgments on anybody and why and why things are going on. It's just my opinions of why this is all coming. So as you can see, Crimea has been an area of contention for centuries. But the war that was fought there between Russia and an alliance of Britain, France, the Ottoman Empire, and Sardinia between October 1853 about, and actually the declaration of war against Russia actually happened uh, yesterday, uh, the 28th of uh, 1854 by the British and the French, which actually made it into a global conflict, you might say. And the end in February of 1856 was one of the most devastating in terms of human suffering until that time. It was to lay the groundwork for the horrible type of trench warfare that would be seen in World War I. Join me next time when I begin to cover the first war to be covered by the media, followed by people from around the world. It mesmerized the world. It was the first modern war, and it was the stuff of legends, like the work of Florence Nightingale and the poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson, The Charge of the Light Brigade. And I will actually do, when the time comes, a reading of The Charge of the Light Brigade by Tennyson as one of those special little podcasts that will be out there. Uh, once I do that, I'm actually going to do something that was recommended by one of the listeners uh, at uh, Facebook on our Russian Rulers History podcast. Uh, we've had some really heated, <laughs> very heated uh, conversations and discussions over the tensions in Ukraine and Russia. But one of the things that was asked there was if I would do a podcast on how I do a podcast. And what are my resources? Uh, how do I go about doing this? How do we get Russian Rulers History Podcast or Russian History Retold? How is it recorded? And you know, what are the kind of works that I use? And I thought that would be a great idea. Another one is, and I put it out on a poll at the uh, Facebook group, is would you be interested in having a kind of a webinar where you can ask questions of me, hopefully I can answer them, uh, about Russian history? You know, so we can show you what Russia's all about in, t in your terms of what you want to hear more about. So I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. And I really want to thank those of you who have donated to us through PayPal and my blog site, www.russianrulershistory.com. It is really greatly appreciated and helps to pay the cost for keeping things going. This is not an inexpensive little podcast, as you might expect, with 139, probably with all those supplemental podcasts, nearing about 160 podcasts already over the past four years. Uh, April will be my fourth year doing this. I uh, hope to keep it going for another few years. Uh, it's going to be a little dicey as I accept my new job and start working on my new projects, but I really love this topic, and I also want to thank some of the listeners who've told me that uh, one of my... I've been actually included in a book as an acknowledgement on Russian history, uh, especially a recent one in 2009, I believe, uh, written by a uh, author from uh, formerly of Forbes magazine, and that she acknowledged this podcast. Uh, it was on events in 2009 because I mean, wasn't around at the time, but it's a current book that's available, and uh, I will uh, you know, post that on my uh, Facebook page. I mean, not Facebook, but on the uh, uh, RussianRulersHistory.com page, so you can see you know, this little acknowledgement about the actually looting of uh, the area around Moscow. So if you ever haven't already, please join us on Facebook at Russian Rulers History Podcast, where we've, again, had some lively and heated discussions over tensions and lots of different topics, and, and people have posted beautiful pictures and stuff like that and links to interesting things about Russia. So now, as always, до свидания и спасибо большое.